All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the sixth Ducks Unlimited Canada's Marsh Masterclass. For those of you who are returning, welcome back. I see many uh, return attendees tonight, so great to have you back with us. And if this is your first Marsh Masterclass, we're very glad you've uh, been able to join us tonight. If you've missed a previous episode, the link to the YouTube videos will be posted in the chat later and was also included in your invitation to this event. So I recognize many of the faces and names again tonight, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cynthia Edwards. I'm the Chief of Major Gift Programs for Ducks Unlimited Canada, and also work cross-border with our wonderful partners in the US and Mexico. I'm also a fourth generation Saskatchewan farmer. And although I don't actively farm anymore, I don't think that ever really leaves you. So I'm very excited about the discussion this evening. It's a topic very close to my heart. We're going to kick off tonight with a fabulous video of the Shell Buffalo Hills Conservation Ranch, which is not too far outside of Calgary, Alberta. I see some of you who were at the Prairie Experience in 2019, and you'll remember this area fondly. So enjoy the video, and I'll be back in a few minutes. This is the Buffalo Hills, and it just goes forever. You look out across the prairies and all that grass is waving at you. It kind of looks like the ocean instead of just grass. This ranch land here is, to me, just gorgeous. To most people it is. It's kind of a surprise around here too, because you look around, it's all canola fields and wheat fields, which is, is great, but this is so rare. It's a, its own little ecosystem. We're at Shell Buffalo Hills Conservation Ranch. It's over 6,000 acres of land owned by Ducks Unlimited, about an hour southeast of Calgary. We've partnered with the provincial government and with other landowners around to, um, to secure the land and to keep it in the native prairie cover that we see today. So we have almost 15,000 acres of prairie protected here. My dad has had this property, man, it goes back to 1925 or 30, I think. I really don't know when the actual beginning was just hasn't gone away yet. I was blessed to grow up here, and I was blessed to be able to have a horse and just go ride those hills. My girls would be fifth generation here. Originally, the ranch was purchased by my great-great-grandfather. We have a great sense of pride for this area. Like, that's probably our favorite thing is just to be out there. And even the smells, <laughs> the smells out there of the native plants, the sage and everything is just, I don't know, it's like it's very healing. And everyone is emotional about it. Like the feeling that you get out there and keeping it as pristine as possible is very important. Stewardship is the all-important key. And we're not gonna drain any of the spots, like if there's water in sloughs in places that we, we really don't like, we're not going to do anything that's gonna channel that water away from there. So everything's gonna remain natural, which supplies habitat for all sorts of things. Our relationship with Ducks Unlimited is pretty exciting because it does give us the opportunity to preserve the land, even maybe if, if my family wasn't here. There's so little of this kind of pristine native land left and that habitat that it offers to all the native animals. And we are bringing back the bison, which, which were once native here in the Buffalo Hills. It's, it's neat, it's like turning back the clock. A few hundred years, it gets, gives people a chance to appreciate maybe what the past and all the history here. Ranchers in the area are the original conservationists and have done a wonderful job um, in, in protecting and conserving landscapes like this. Ducks Unlimited can provide expertise and support to just make sure that these landscapes aren't lost to development. 
this land is so pristine and so natural and just so awesome. I just think that it needs to be saved and shared with future generations. And when things are going south on you in life, it's kind of nice to get back to nature and just getting your mind in the right place. And I think you can do that here. Great, thank you. There's some beautiful scenery in that video and I'm not exactly sure how many times I've watched it, but I am mesmerized every time I do. So I love those wide open spaces and hearing the ranchers talk about all that that land provides them and, and us. So thank you again for joining us tonight. All of you, our volunteers, partners and major donors are essential to keeping our conservation machine running. And despite the challenges we've all faced this past year, we've been able to do just that. One of my favorite things about the DU family is that it enables us as individuals to be part of something bigger than our own backyards. And that's a special opportunity. And we'll hear about the large impact of our uh, work with agriculture here tonight. So a couple housekeeping items before we get started. All of you are on mute. We will have a couple breaks for questions throughout this evening. If you have a question, please type it into the chat and I can either read it for you or if you'd rather uh, ask it yourself, just ask me to unmute you at the appropriate time. And also, I'm obligated to let you know that we're recording the class this evening, so please be on your best behavior. So tonight we're gonna learn more about the strong connection between landowners, farmers, ranchers, and Ducks Unlimited Canada, and where we can improve to continue to improve to build on a more sustainable future together. We've had a very long 80 plus year history working together and I, for one, see lots of potential moving forward. But tonight we're gonna to hear a bit more about how we can benefit ag and conservation together. We share this landscape, this vast landscape, as I sit in the middle of Saskatchewan here tonight. And if DU Canada is going to be successful in meeting our mission, we need to work at scale. And that requires a strong partnership with agriculture. Across Canada, we're very proud of the um, Partnerships we forged with agriculture, including the Dairy Farmers of Canada's Pro Action Program, the forage and beef sectors we're going to hear about tonight, including an exciting new partnership with Cargill and McDonald's Canada. And for years, we've been proud proponents of winter cereals. So this is our first panel discussion on the masterclass, and we've got four exceptional guests with us tonight. First, we have Gary Stanford. Gary is from McGrath, Alberta. He's the past president of the Grain Growers of Canada and past chair of the Alberta Wheat Commission. In his roles, Gary has traveled around the world meeting with customers who buy Canadian grain. I think he mentioned 18 countries the other day. Gary is a longtime winter wheat grower and is a leader in the grain industry. Welcome, Gary. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Thank you. Anne Wasco is the current chair of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. She also runs a livestock market analyst company, analysis company, sorry, and is a rancher from East End, Saskatchewan. Hi, Anne was recently named one of the top 50 Canadian agriculture influencers in the mentorship category by the Canadian Western Agribition. So congratulations, Anne, and welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. We also have a couple of the UK Canada staff with us this evening. For the last five years, Christine Tapley has been our lead for Everything Beef as our liaison with the beef industry overall. She has direct ties to agriculture as a cow-calf operator near Landgruth, Manitoba, only miles away from DU Canada's Duck Factory No. 1 at Big Grass Marsh. Christine is a counselor of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef and has her master's in animal science. Hey, Christine. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Lastly, Paul Thorogood has been with us for 24 years and as our main liaison with the crop sector. In addition to working with Ducks Unlimited Canada, Paul owns and operates a grain farm near Moose Jaw. Paul is past chair of the Soil Conservation Council of Canada and a founding director of the Saskatchewan Winter Cereals Development Commission. And I've had the pleasure of working for Paul for most of those 24 years. So welcome, Paul. 
Thanks, Cynthia. Happy Wednesday, everybody. So we are going to focus the discussion tonight on a series of questions for our panel, but of course want audience participation. So I do encourage you again to use the chat function and we'll get to your questions. If we don't get to your question tonight, um, Patty will place in the chat um, an email address that you can reach out to us at uh, if you want additional follow-up. So we'll get started with our first question. First, we want to look at how you would describe the current state of sustainable agriculture in Canada. And I think Gary, will, or Anne, we'll start with you on this one and then move to Gary. Anne? Okay, thanks, Cynthia. Um, I think, first of all, I'm going to start with what sustainability means to me. And to me, sustainability is that continuous journey, um, continuous improvement, a constantly evolving journey. So at the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, we have our definition, which is a socially responsible, environmentally sound, economically viable product that prioritizes plant, planet, people, animals, and progress. Put another way, that means farmers, ranchers, processors, everyone in that supply chain involved in bringing beef to your table are dedicated to conserving the land, the air, the water, uh, raising our animals responsibly, uh, caring for our families and our communities, and embracing technology and innovation to uh, grounded in science to make those uh, advancements. I would just also add though, this isn't something new. Uh, farmers and ranchers have been pr producing beef sustainably in Canada for generations and continually improving their processes. So um, I think uh, we're having a conversation about it tonight. It's certainly a topic that's being talked about a lot, but to many of us, it's not new. Exactly right. For many of us, this is an ongoing conversation. Thanks, Anne. Maybe we'll move to you, Gary. Um, hi, thanks for having me on. It's an honor to be here and work with it. I started working with Ducks Unlimited with the winter wheat part of it. I've been seeding winter wheat on my farm all my life. And uh, I live in a farm down in southern Alberta, south of Lethbridge. Matter of fact, my great grandfather in 1903 in southern Alberta, close to Cardston, actually planted the first winter wheat that was seeded in uh, Alberta. So what I've learned from doing the fall seeding, direct seeding of winter wheat, was is that why can't we do this in the spring? And so this got me into direct seeding 25 years ago uh, to try and save moisture, to try and not disturb the soil. And also by seeding the winter wheat and having the crops in the spring, there is a better chance for waterfowl to, to nest in the crops. Grain farmers are very innovative and uh, by direct seeding, in using less inputs, becoming more efficient with our fertilizer uses, our herbicides, our fuel. We believe we're on the right track, but we've always got a little bit more to do. Thank you. Great, maybe we'll move to you, Christine, and your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's lots and lots of movement in um, sustainability with regards to agriculture. and. And specifically in the conservation uh, conversation, I think that um, the concept of no new land is, is starting to be more and more prevalent in that conversation. And it's not just coming from us anymore. It's um, being talked about in those metrics. And um, when we think about, uh, you know, those sustainability roundtables and things like that, there's a lot of other folks who are recognizing the importance of, of conservation and, and um, producing more, because we all know we need to produce more, but producing more on the same acres and, and not doing any more conversion. But that said, I think that it's really important to then as a conservation community to embrace modern farming, um, because that's a huge task um, for the farming community to have to increase production that way to meet that global growing demand. Um, but they need all the tools and science that we can offer them to be able to, to meet those demands, I think, and we shouldn't be handcuffing them. Um, it's not, like you said at the, in your opening remarks, Cynthia, it's one landscape and we're not gonna accomplish our mission uh, without working together. Great, thanks, Christine. We'll wrap this question up with you, Paul. 
Hey, thanks, Cynthia. The nice thing about being last in a panel discussion is you get to build on the the things that your smart co-panelists shared. And I think one of the first things I want to touch on, uh, Christine mentioned the idea of building onto science and um, whether it's our first research that we did looking at um, establishing the waterfall value of winter cereals, uh, where typically uh, everyone knew that annual cropland was the wasteland for, for nesting birds until we went and looked and lo and behold, there were ducks nesting there. And that was a, a big change in the industry. And more recently, we've looked at, at carbon sequestration in wetlands and, and how that can play a role as we manage carbon uh, moving ahead. So it, it's been, it's been a, a very exciting part from a science perspective. And Gary talked about no-till and DU Canada has been proud to be part of many of the important conservation moves and movements in agriculture. And certainly no-till is something that's transformed crop production on the prairies. Um, and for those who aren't uh, are no-tillers in our crowd, basically zero tillage or no-till is uh, not cultivating the ground prior to seeding. So your stubble from the previous crop is there. You seed into it without disturbing and it protects the soil. And uh, uh, a, a mentor of mine when I started at, at DU, Lee Motes, um, was a, an early pioneer in no-till in Saskatchewan. And um, we had another staff member uh, in Manitoba, um, Bill Poole, who was uh, honored in the Soil Conservation Council uh, Hall of Fame for his work on no-till. So I, I think that was very exciting. And lastly, um, I wanted to talk about something that Ann mentioned, which is sustainability is not a place that you get to. It's about continually improving. And I, I always struggle when someone says, well, I'm sustainable today because tomorrow we might not be um, because everything changes. And that, that the example I give is on our farm at home. Um, my great grandfather uh, homesteaded there. And in his original homestead, the blow dirt ridge is about as tall as I am. And for those of you who can't tell, uh, looking over uh, your computer screen, I'm six foot six. So that is a huge pile of soil. Now, it's easy for me to look back and say, well, gosh, what was great granddad doing? But he was using the best practices of the day. And there actually used to be contests for who could plow the stress. So today, we would not want to see our soil blow. So we, we know till at home. Um, but uh, it's not fair to judge great granddad by our metrics today. And I would hope that when uh, my son or his children back at the way we farm, they would say, gosh, I think that Paul did the best he could given the information of the day. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, so before we open up to, to questions, I think we'll move on to, to question number two from our panelists and, and dig into this topic a, a little bit more. Uh, for many of you, you know, you, you might not see the obvious connection between uh, Ducks Unlimited Canada's wetland and waterfowl mission and agriculture. So I think we'll uh, ask our panelists how they would characterize our DU Canada's collaborative efforts to advance sustainable agriculture. And maybe we'll stick with Paul on this one to, to ask first and explain a bit more about our work with the crop sector. And, and then we'll move on to Christine and then our, our guests, Gary and Anne. Absolutely. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we've been involved with the crop sector since the, the 80s. And uh, at that time, no-till was a big movement. But in 1992, we made our first investments in winter wheat, which uh, we found out was a, a good nesting habitat for waterfowl. And, and since that time, we've invested considerable money in uh, plant breeding and all that sort of thing. Um, but more recently, we've certainly broadened that out. And um, the idea of sustainable agriculture has really gained a foothold. And uh, it's given us an opportunity and a, and a, a venue to have really positive uh, discussions with the industry, with farmers, uh, and with uh, commodity groups. And, and Gary's a good example of someone who, who sits on those boards. And it's been a great place to talk about the value of not only conservation tillage, but protecting wetlands and habitat on, on your farm. And I think in return, um, working with a, a conservation group like Ducks Unlimited provides that level of credibility for, for the, the industry that what they are doing actually does have uh, scientific merit and, and someone to kind of stand behind and the, the claims are on environmental value. Awesome, thanks, Paul. Maybe Christine, we'll, we'll move to you. And I don't know if all of you noticed, but Christine has an awesome birch tree in her background, which is in her parents' house. <laughs> yeah, my, my parents have better internet, so I uh, hijacked their desk, but they have a, um, a pretty cool house. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think as far as the beef industry and collaboration with sustainable agriculture, I mean, it's no secret that Dexon Limited has been working collaboratively with the beef industry really since its beginning, right? I mean, projects on grass and, and water um, have been a staple. Uh, but tonight, I, I kind of wanted to talk about something a little bit different, and, and it's the, our role or our potential role in that public trust space. Because as Anne mentioned, uh, one of the really important pillars of, of uh, sustainability is the social side of things. And I think that us from the conservation camp have you know, a role that we could be spokespeople for all the good things that are happening in agriculture that we're talking about tonight. And I think that when we look at the general public, um, maybe they don't recognize how food choices do have a direct impact on the landscape and on our conservation, um, you know, our, our mission in conservation. And I think that um, it's really important for us to make sure we're always bringing in the context, right? Um, in Canada, we're not knocking down rainforests to grow beef. Um, what did this landscape look like historically? It was it was grass and water, right? It was the Canadian prairies. And, and so Canadian beef industry, as it is now, supports that native habitat. Uh, we don't have to have one without the other. And so um, I think that message is a really great role for us as a conservation community. And we've been doing that. Um, certainly DU has had a, a great hand in some of the recent messages that have gone out. There's a Guardians of the Grassland documentary we got to uh, partake in, which has won numerous awards actually at film festivals across the country. Um, we've had you know, different pieces in the Toronto Star and National Post and, and all with this um, message of explaining the Canadian context and explaining how beef production relates to wetland and grassland conservation in Canada. Great, thanks, Christine. Um, we'll move on to Gary. What what your what are your thoughts? Um, you know, agriculture is sure a big business, a uh, big sector, and so you can see all the diversifications in it. And one way I think that we could be more sustainable is to start writing everything down what we are doing on our farms. I seeded some marginal land back into grass, working with DU over the last few years. And uh, it has helped preserve wetlands. It has helped uh, keep the wildlife in place, the waterfowl in place. And I asked uh, Ducks Unlimited, why did you come to Southern Alberta? Why did you want to work here? And uh, they said that they needed to uh, save the pintail ducks at that time. This is a few years ago. And I said, well, why is this area important here? And they said that the ducks fly north along California coast up to Oregon over to um, up to Seattle and then they catch the Chinook winds or the Pineapple Express we call it and they come over and they nest on the Milk River Ridge along here so I did a lot of uh, helping work with it with pintail duck so it's it's funny how how it affects you and you can help but you didn't really know so some farmers are very good at preserving riparian areas wetlands some farmers are very good at using irrigation water we have we use here taking care of the water uh, efficiently, soil fertility. So what my thoughts are is we need to collaborate going forward with all farmers, write down what we're doing, put this in a code of practice so that that way it's on the shelf for all of us to see what we're done doing now and what we can do better in the future. Great, thanks Gary. And we'll wrap up this one with you. Well, thanks. Those have been great comments. And um, Gary just mentioned that collaboration piece and, and Christine telling some of the stories about um, beef industry and working with Ducks Unlimited. I thought I'd just share Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Of course, we're a multi-stakeholder, not-for-profit organization, and our mission is to advance Canadian beef industry sustainability. Well, having folks um, like Ducks Unlimited, um, other NGOs, at the table with beef producers and other folks in the beef supply chain, it brings that other perspective, a very important perspective to the table uh, when we're all talking. It pushes us as industry, I think, to do better, um, giving constructive uh, feedback as well. And I've always thought we can 
do more together. And uh, that, that's where I come from on that. I, I just wanted to also mention the other obvious benefit with having folks uh, like Ducks Unlimited, uh, um, Nature Conservancy, a lot of the other uh, NGOs that are also members of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef at that table. It, it gives our sustainability mission um, more credibility, credibility in terms of, especially when we talk outside of agriculture, um, your voice uh, goes to much different places than a beef industry uh, voice might go. And I, I once heard Carla Gunn say this, uh, ducks need cattle and cattle need ducks. So it's best together. That's great, Anne. While you were uh, talking, I was thinking of one of my favorite slogans we had on our Ducks Unlimited t-shirts. I maybe 2004, 2005, I think it was Lee Motes who's on the, on the call tonight uh, came up with it. it. Across the back it said, help conserve uh, wildlife, eat Canadian beef. <laughs> exactly. Gets right to the point. <laughs> Cynthia, Cynthia, I have to apologize. I've got to leave. I have another local chapter DU meeting starting shortly. Okay. I would like to stay and listen, but I'm sorry. I have Thank to Thank you. Thank you for joining. So we do have some questions in the in the chat. Um, so maybe I'll start with this uh, great question from Mick Anderson. Hi, Mick. Uh, so his question is, given recent research that modern ag has been draining soil carbon stocks, and the potential for carbon sequestration, what can we at, at DU do with growers to help aid that uh, the producers work to aid carbon capture or sequestration? And, and maybe Gary, I'll start with you on, on this one. Yeah, sure, thanks for the question. Um, I think that uh, if you go back 25, 30, 40 years ago, we were terrible at uh, sequestering carbon. We just, I don't think we understood it. I don't think we, uh, you know, we knew what greenhouse gases were. And uh, by us changing the way we farm, direct seeding, uh, less tillage equipment at all, um, better herbicides that we've been able to use. I think that now we're a very good carbon sink. I think that, uh, all farmers are getting better at it. I think we've got a little bit ways to go, but uh, you know, the, the, our provincial, our federal governments, you know, wants to keep uh, taxing us on carbon, but I think that they should, uh, you know, give some benefit to the farmers for the work they've done in uh, sequestering carbon. And I think that, uh, you know, we're doing a very good job and I think that we're getting better at it. So. It's a good question, but I think that we're going in the right direction. Great. Maybe Paul, do you have anything to add to, to that? Sure. Yeah. And, and Gary's right on for, for the prairies. And I think it depends on where you look in North America, how good a job we're doing uh, as an ag industry is sequestering carbon. Um, on Prairie Canada and kind of the very northern U.S. states where no-till has been adopted and long-term crop rotations have been pretty diverse. Actually, we've seen significant rebuilding of that soil organic matter, which sequesters carbon. In the parts of the North America where we see more of a soybean and corn rotation and lots of tillage, uh, like Ontario, Quebec, and, and the Corn Belt through US, we don't see that carbon sequestration happening because an oversimplification is tillage is the enemy of soil organic carbon. And uh, there's a lot of tillage in, in those systems. Um, the other thing I would mention without diving really deep into uh, uh, ag acronyms, um, there's a new um, fertilizer management system called the 4Rs, which I will not go into it. Cynthia made me promise not to talk too much about acronyms, um, <laughs> but um, it, it's, a, it's a model for managing your, your fertilizer use so that you minimize your greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that's another really important step that DU has been involved with uh, supporting and, and extending out to farmers. That is another BMP that, as Gary said, we're starting to become more aware of that. And uh, I think there's some real opportunities uh, for agriculture going ahead on the carbon front. And, and practices like that are, are a real um, opportunity, I think, to, to add value and to do a good thing for the environment. Great. And we actually had a follow-up question from Jeff. Hey, Jeff on what is happening in, in Canada on, with trying to reduce greenhouse gases on the cattle side. So maybe Anne will go to, to you for your thoughts on that one. Great follow-up well, sure. question. Okay, great, great question. I was actually in our third question gonna talk a little bit about 
the beef industry's goals, but that's fine. Uh, well, I, th that's kind of a key point. First of all, Canada, from a Canadian beef perspective um, versus say global information, which can be two very different things. Canada's uh, cattle beef footprint is 2.4% of Canada's greenhouse gases. So certainly um, less than half of what the global average would be, for example. So certainly our production systems in, in North America and Canada, Canada specifically um, are low, but there's lots of work to do. And one of the goals that has been set by the industry, by ourselves, is com we're committed for emissions reduction. Um, we've got a set of 10-year goals, so it's out 2030 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by another 33% by 2030. And uh, again, those are going to be rooted in science, innovation, uh, things like uh, we've talked about already in terms of uh, uh, carbon sequestration, but some of the other data, and we have to measure these things too, and that's part of it. Uh, and part of the, one of the, some of the work that we do at the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef is that benchmarking uh, measurement piece of it, uh, so that we can talk about where we were, where we are today, and where we want to go. Uh, but even from the 1981 to 2011, that 30-year time frame, uh, we already saw significant improvements in terms of that environmental footprint. 17% uh, less water used by cattle, 29% less uh, breeding cattle to produce the same pound of beef, 24% le less land, and 15% less greenhouse gases, just in that 30-year time frame. So um, we're committed to emissions reductions, and um, we're on that path. Great, thank you. Christine, anything you wanted to add on onto that on the cattle side? Yeah, Great sure. Yeah, I think that Anne really covered well the the amazing progress that's happened so far and, and continuous improvement, as she said at the beginning. Um, I think there's some really exciting things um, as far as you know in Ruben in Ruben uh, stuff that that can happen in the cattle industry. Um, but again, with the conservation hat on, I think that uh, always in the car carbon conversation we have a really you know exciting story to say or an important story to tell there in that you know uh, wetlands and grasslands are so important in storing um, that carbon and we really just need to keep making sure that people recognize that if we lose those acres um, you know that's going to be a really bad news story for for the carbon uh, story so one one fact that I always love to share is that um, a, a wetland that takes up 10% of a piece of property, that little 10% holds 90% of the carbon on that entire piece of property. So, you know, just the value that are in these, these little hot spots, I think is, is really important. And I know that there's issues with, um, you know, increased carbon and, and carbon sequestration as far as how we roll out programs and we always want to pull more carbon down and, and it's harder to talk about keeping the carbon that we have in the ground, but it, it, is, it is really vital that we, we don't make the story worse by, by releasing more carbon than we have now. Right. I think we've got uh, time for one more question, uh, kind of keeping with the climate change theme. Uh, we had a, another question from Mick about corn. Um, so corn's moving north with, with climate change. We're seeing more areas we can grow corn. And although it, it provides some winter nutrition for waterfowl, it doesn't provide much nesting habitat like winter cereals. And his question is just, are you seeing an enthusiasm for corn among farmers? And, and do you see this as a, as a building trend? Maybe I'll, I'll turn to Gary or Paul to, to comment on that first. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I live over in Alberta, and there is some corn growing in the irrigation, but a lot of that is used for silage. And you're right, where they grow potatoes by Lethbridge and they grow corn by Lethbridge, sugar beets, the soil is, uh, is cultivated. And so I don't know how we're going to change that. But one thing I do know is, is that when, they, when they're done their harvest, they go seed winter wheat right away to stop soil erosion, and then uh, they'll leave it till spring. So I think that there's always things we can learn to do better, but in uh, most of Saskatchewan and Alberta, you're not gonna see a great deal of corn. It's too cold here and uh, too short of a growing season. 
Yeah, I think right. that when when we look at where corn has moved and soybeans along with it, um, you know, Red River Valley in southeastern uh, uh, Manitoba, where they have more heat and more moisture, um, we saw soybeans kind of wander their way into Saskatchewan, and then we had a couple of years of drought, and they wandered their way back out again. Um, but I don't want to be so so bold as to say. Um, that we'll never grow them because 25 years ago when I moved back to the farm, we were the first people to grow canola and I grew it for two years and said, gosh, I'm never going to do that again. And now a third of our acreage is in canola because the banker says it's a really good idea. So um, I, I don't think I would be uh, bold enough to say that we will never see corn and soybeans as a significant acreage, especially with plant breeding advances and uh, changing climate. Um, but I think what that says is as folks interested in conservation we have to have our head up and we have to look for opportunities and maybe it's more winter cereals but maybe it's something completely different um, maybe there's some other crop out there whether it's uh, using shoulder season cover crops or whether it's um, other winter planted crops like canola actually grows as a winter type in Europe and if it happened to get warm enough maybe that could be uh, there's also some winter pulses that that some folk playing around with so I think what it says is we need to keep our head up and keep current with what's going on in the industry to look for those <clears throat> pardon me to look for those opportunities that fit our conservation mission yeah that whole um point that Anne made earlier about sustainability being the journey right we don't know what it's going to be 25 years from now that's a good example it's a good example I think we'll uh continue with our last question for our for our last official question for our panelists, and then we'll have more time for, for audience questions at the end. So moving into the, to the future, so given that we've talked about sustainability being a, a journey, what do you really see for the future of ag-related conservation opportunities? And maybe Gary, we'll start, start with you for this one and then move on to Anne and, and Christine and Paul. So Gary, thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I've had the privilege of traveling to many countries over the last seven or eight years, helping sell our spring wheat and winter wheat. I've been able to travel through South America, through Asia and into Europe. And uh, after I'm done my presentation, being a grain farmer, of course, they want to ask you lots of questions. So this would be from the grain buyers from the country from the diplomats from the country, and then also from the flour millers from the country. And uh, some of the main questions I get asked is, how do I farm sustainably? How do I seed my crop and harvest my crop sustainably? How much fertilizer do I use? And how do I take care of it? How much water do I use when I'm irrigating my crops? And is the water clean? Where does the water come from? How do I store my grain and keep it uh, dry and pest free? And uh, the one buyer in Colombia, he said to me, your Canadian grain is so cold that it creates condensation when it gets here to Colombia. And I'm like, well, when it's 40 below here, I don't know what I can do about that. But it does help our pest problem. We don't have pests, you know, bugs in our grain. And so we have very good storage, very good, but they want to hear this. They want to know what we're doing and how we're taking care of it because we have such good products here in Canada. If we could work more together with other groups like Ducks Unlimited, and I'm talking about grain commissions, cattle commissions, and write this all down sustainably of how we're doing this. Put it on a website where it'll be ready, let readily available to all these people in other countries that are buying our, buying our crops. Um, if, if they could see what we're doing and what we're working on, I believe that this would be a, a major feather in our cap. Now, this could include the large urban cities in uh, North America as well. They really don't know what all we do on a farm. And one thing before I, I finish this is uh, Cereal Canada, which is our help market our grain, with uh, SIGI and Winnipeg Canadian International Grains Institute, with Ducks Unlimited, and with the farm commissions, we're working on an eco label with winter wheat to use in our products, and then it would have a uh, wildlife or waterfowl on the pit on the eco label. This would be able to be put on the on the products on the shelf for consumers, where they could see that we are environmentally friendly, and so we're working on that now with. Uh, 
Paul with the U and with uh, the folks in Winnipeg. And today I spent uh, two hours with a flour miller here close by where I live going through it. And he's so excited about getting on board with this that uh, we could, we could uh, have an eco label to put on this product. So I think we are moving forward, but I think that we need to start writing this all down. Awesome, thanks Gary. And what, what about your thoughts for the future? Well, in a nutshell, I'm, I'm pretty excited. I think about the, the future of uh, sustainable agriculture, first of all, in a broad text, and then from where I, with the hat that I wear as a, as a rancher. Um, I mentioned a minute ago about the Canadian beef industry goals that we've just set this past um, winter. Um, they're, they're pretty ambitious 10 year goals um, and meant you know, to provide some very positive and clear messaging around our desire to continually improve these practices. You've heard that theme through the evening tonight, um, reduce our carbon footprint and enhance that natural environment. So these goals um, highlight the work of the Canadian beef industry as integral for that climate change mitigation. We know we have to be part of that solution and, uh, and the overall sustainability of our food system. Prior to COVID, we didn't have a lot of discussion about food um, security in our food system, but certainly that's to the um, top of discussion among consumers. Um, Christine talked about public, in, uh, public trust and building that public trust is based on doing the right things for our land, our animals and our environment. And that's precisely what these goals are, uh, are um, meant to demonstrate. I, I think we see ourselves as the beef sector, as a beef industry, as a solutions provider and Christine's kind of touched on that um, part of it. Uh, we wanna raise public awareness of our excellent sustainability um, uh, the numerous environmental benefits uh, of beef production here in Canada. We're committed to, uh, to improvement and we're really proud of uh, what the beef we provide to feed Canadians and, and the world. So it's a, it's a good news story and I'm, I'm excited to be part of it. Great. And maybe I'll turn it to Christine now. I know she shares your enthusiasm and excitement <laughs> for the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, as a beef producer, um, but also with my conservation hat on, um, you know, I get to live in the best of both worlds, I think. Um, but yeah, I think when I think about future opportunities for the conservation um, side of things, you know, there's many of the leading uh, companies in sustainability are trying to align themselves. Um, just like Anne talked about, the beef industry really setting some pretty massive goals um, to get down that road of sustainability and, and align with the Paris Agreement and UN sustainability goals and things like that. Um, and so, for example, some of these companies have really massive carbon emission reduction goals, um, you know, from their scope three or their supply chain emissions. And when we think about where Canadian agri-food companies are sourcing from, it's a lot of times coming from the prairie pothole region. Um, and so those supply chains have huge impact on the landscape that's important to our mission. And I think it's really important, of course, to remember then that wetlands have so much more to offer than just duck habitats that, of course, we always think about. Um, and maybe we can have a role in helping those companies or those organizations, whoever they are, reach those goals while also driving our mission. And I think that DU is uniquely positioned to be, um, you know, it, to be in that spot and be that conduit. Um, because for one, I think that we're pragmatic and we understand what agriculture is up against. Second, I think that we are science-based in our decision-making and therefore we have and we have the ability to validate the claims and help those um, groups reach those, reach those targets with valid claims. And then lastly, we have the manpower and the ex experience you know, to roll those programs and, and practices out across the landscape. That's what DU has been doing for, again, more than 80 years, right? And, and so I think we're really you know, poised to, to be part of this conversation in a big way and really drive that. Um, so that's, you know, what gets me <laughs> all excited. Um, but I, you know, I know this is your job, but I would pass it on to, to Paul and, and say, because 
is that even more than in the beef industry, I think in the crop side of things, often we're the only conservation uh, group at the table, or at least in those Canadian conversations. And so I think he could add to that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Christine. And yeah, you're right. On on the crop side, DU is typically the only conservation group that's involved in the sustainability discussion. And you know, that's that's a great opportunity, but also a great responsibility. Um, and I, I think the experience a consumer has is so different with beef, which is you know a product that that you buy, whereas often crops are an ingredient. And you know, you look at the list on a granola bar, and there's a lot of different crops went into making that granola bar, and um, how the industry deals with them is also different. Um, I, I heard an interesting presentation from uh, Nestle, which is a company probably everyone's heard of, and their vice president of ingredient sourcing, I think, was her title or something similar to that. She said, "Today we have a spec sheet that says these are the qualities of the good that I'm purchasing. So whether it's protein or oil or whatever the contents are." She said, in five to 10 years, we're going to have two spec sheets. One is, what is the good oil, protein, et cetera. The other spec sheet will be, how was this produced? And whether, and she didn't know exactly what those specs would be, but it would be water efficiency. It would be a greenhouse gas emission, biodiversity, and all that sort of thing. And I think that's tremendously exciting. And I think for consumers, and many consumers are very interested in what the consequences their food choices may have. And, you know, today I would contend that most of the, the brands that you can choose from on the market are pretty simplified. And often the environmental issue that I'm concerned in may or may not translate well to what the little logo is I see on the container. So hopefully in the future, and it might be through one of these things, and I'm holding up a cell phone, that you scan a, a little code and it tells you the story of the food. Um, the amount of information we can convey to a consumer is, is so massive compared to what we can do today. And I think ratcheting down right to the farm gate, uh, something that I'm really excited about is the impact of technology on conservation. And when Precision Ag first came out, many of us, many people were concerned that, well, you know, Paul puts his tractor on auto steer and he doesn't want to do anything else. So we're going to flatten everything in, in the path. Well, I think that may have been some early steps in the precision ag movement, but today I look at, at the work that people are doing and you know exactly where your profit comes from on your farm and where you're not making a profit. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity, again, as, as things like carbon and, and other environmental services become more valuable, maybe people will take a portion of their farm that doesn't make the money that they chronically lose money on and seed it back to, to grass or something like that, sequester some carbon and, and do an environmental good that also does them economic good. So I, I think it's, it's tremendously exciting. And you know, the, the farming future for well, people like Christine or for other people's children, because Christine's so much younger than the rest of us panelists, <laughs> um, that uh, I think the future is very exciting for, for that next generation of, of farmers. And I just wish that I was as young as I think I am. That's great. Those those are great responses, everyone. Th thank you so much for that. Uh, um, I wanted to circle back for a minute to something that Christine mentioned earlier that that I think we could do a whole other episode of this about, and, and that's how your food choices really matter. I think that's from all of what I've heard tonight, uh, you know, for most of us who are um, simply consumers, that really does make a difference. And those food choices do do matter. And I think the more we can be um, upfront and transparent about that, the, the better. So um, we do have a couple more questions in the in the chat. I think we, we do have a few few minutes. Um, question about US ag policy um, and, and Canadian ag policy. So question is for, from Mick Anderson. Uh, US ag policy encourages farmers to produce quantity over quality and calories versus food. The question is, are Canadian government policies helping or hurting sustainability? And if helping, what can we learn from, from other countries, including the US? So I'm not, that's a big loaded question. We probably spend a whole one on that, but maybe I'll turn it to Gary. You wanna take that one? Yeah, well, when I read that question, I thought that's a great question. You know, uh, I dealt with, uh, I, I was president of the Green Growers of Canada down in Ottawa 
spent a lot of time down there and we talked about a lot of policy issues and you're, you're correct, Mick, that, um, you know, the farm bill down in the States is a total different animal than it is in Canada. So the farm bill down there, you know, grow your crop, get it out and, and uh, let's, you know, try and not uh, try and make money. Where in Canada, it's a little different. We're so far from all of our markets that uh, we try and grow higher quality grain. So our uh, plant breeders, uh, when they go to bring in a new variety, it, is, uh, it has to go through a stringent uh, protocol so that it has, meets certain requirements for quality and for yield and for uh, you know, uh, disease resistance. So we, have a, uh, we still have crop insurance up here, but we don't have a farm bill. So farmers are gonna try and grow the best crop they can, the highest yielding one they can, but it has to meet certain quality requirements to be able to sell through the grain companies and the grain companies are gonna pay you better, more for higher quality grain. So it is a different kettle of fish, but on the other hand, we, if we grow poor quality, we won't get paid as much for it. So it's a great question. I hope I understand, <laughs> I could explain it a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, we do the best we can here, but we, but our wheat is higher quality, so we get more money. Great, thanks. Um, Anne, anything you wanted to add on, on to that question on the from the beef sector side, maybe? No, that well, that was good uh, examples from from Gary for sure. Um, certainly, with the new administration in the U.S. and uh, our our current uh, government, certainly both focused on uh, f climate change, and uh, so you do see some some more parallels. I suspect it's early on for U.S. Um, uh, details, but I, I do think you're going to see parallels and and where we are certainly at the, the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef is working together that collaboration piece. Um, I was on a, a call a meeting with Paul yesterday in terms of a, a large group between industry and government working on sustainability. So um, it's it's a discussion, it's moving, um, but it's certainly it's a big focus for our federal government here in Canada. Yes. Great. I see um, Lee Motes has his hand raised, so maybe I'll ask Lee to unmute and welcome. Okay. Can you hear me, uh, Cynthia? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. And uh, everybody has these nice scenes behind them. Uh, this is my backyard, actually. The sun just went down. Unfortunately, you missed the sunset. But my, my question is, is mostly for Paul, I think, and, and that is to do with Ducks Unlimited's participation in all of these things in the annual crop uh, 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 world, you mentioned kind of being the only conservation group uh, present. I, uh, I found myself quite disturbed in uh, the code of practice discussions that have been going on uh, with the backlash towards Ducks Unlimited as, as if Ducks Unlimited is, is uh, you know, going to infringe on the freedom that we have as, as, as farmers. So, so how do we get uh, to the stage where you know, a Ducks Unlimited project is one of those uh, qualities that a consumer wants to buy from the present day when Ducks Unlimited is, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, uh, suffering uh, some, some really significant critique, maybe, maybe not justifiable critique either, but nonetheless suffering. Well, thanks Lee, never a dull question when you've got Lee in the audience. Um, and, and I always say that, you know, when the environment becomes an asset rather than a liability is when people are excited about having it on their farm. And, and for people like Anne and Christine, well, grass and water are, are their asset. Um, the, the person that I, 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 I've been to his farm is Spencer Hilton, um, which is, uh, he farms in near Strathmore, Alberta, I think it is, Gary. And he has a wetland project on his farm where he produces malt barley that he uh, also owns a little malting plant and then ships some of his uh, um, malt down to a brewery in California and, and their name escapes me right now. But that DU wetland project is part of his marketing and the fact that he is, you know, looking after water and, and, uh, and that sort of thing is part of his marketing campaign. And, and I think that that's one of the things that we have to, to find our way to is, is where the industry views having 
environment. And, and many people, and I, I think Derry would support this, when he goes overseas and talks to customers, they perceive Canada to be this beautiful place full of trees and mountains and running water. And having conservation projects is part of that pristine um, reputation that Canada enjoys, I would say. And hopefully our projects can, can someday be viewed as, as part of that asset on the landscape. Did I get at your question, Lee? Well, kind of, sorta. Uh, what I what I want to know is what uh, Ducks Unlimited is going to do to to advocate for a new quality relative to the crops that we grow. Because because if it's true that consumers are the ones that really rule the world by their choices, which I think is becoming an increasing trend, then how do you how do you get the consumer to ask for the what you would consider to be the right quality? Hey, could I answer that question for you, Paul? I sure, just, Derek, uh, um, I was uh, on another Zoom call today and the guy said to me, he says, so which arm of the government is Ducks Unlimited? Is it provincial or federal? And I, and I, I was just so surprised that people didn't understand that. So in Lee, when you're asking your questions, I, I totally get what you're saying. Like, how are we going to how are we going to move this forward and have a better agenda? But when you've got farmers that don't like Ducks Unlimited, and you've got farmers that think they're an arm of the government, how, how do we uh, meet this together and, and try and, and let farmers understand what the good work Ducks Unlimited does, you know, but keep the government separate from it? So I don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think there's still work to be done. Yeah, and, and I think we are branching out our work beyond, like we, we I, I think we're well-established working with Crops Roundtable, Beef Roundtable, um, but we're just beginning to dip our toe into the water of the food industry. And, um, you know, starting to work with companies, um, Christine uh, had, had a long-standing relationship with McDonald's uh, when she came to DU, and uh, we've done a little bit of work with them. And, and I think helping some of those companies uh, achieve their sustainability goals and helping them to see how environment is part of that solution and maybe not just um, you know let's go plant some trees and we'll, we'll say we achieved our goals it's it's well let's actually understand how the environment works and and translate that into uh, fulfilling some of those corporate and social responsibility goals that those companies have great Can I add a couple comments Cynthia? yeah Christine. Yeah, I, um, you know, on the beef side, I think that, um, and Anne, you can maybe speak to this better than me, but, um, you know, we felt the heat from the public uh, kind of giving us a black eye um, and ended up having to play catch up and explain ourselves rather than being able to get out in front and, you know, have those good news stories. And instead we're on the defensive. And um, so I, I think that, and, and two, I think that beef and conservation were at odds um, at one point, and it's been a long road. And, and I think now we are um, have made great strides. Um, but it's a big value chain, too, right? And, and so I think that, as Anne mentioned before, um, having conservation groups at the round table adds that credibility. And we've heard that from a lot of places um, across the value chain and recognizing that, that we're getting the heat because we're the only one at the table right now. Um, but I think that if we can keep our heads down and keep pushing, um, then hopefully the rest of that value chain will, will show that value and pull everybody along with it because it, it's not going to not happen. It's just whether or not you want to walk that way or you're going to be pushed that way. So I, I really am hopeful that we can, um, you know, not have the crop industry uh, be on the defensive and instead have them recognize that this is an important um, direction. Great. Anne, anything to add to that? I'll just, I'll just add briefly, because Christine gave me this, this opening. I know we're right up against time. But we can't get ourselves in the beef industry. We had this partner um, that really pushed us hard, and it's been mentioned here already. McDonald's came and said, 
we want this. Our end user told us we want to be able to prove that we can track and verify sustainable beef supply from the ranch to that patty in their restaurant. And so uh, at our operation, we got involved in that pilot project in 2014. And, and here we are, we've been able to successfully do it. But it really took that initiative at that end user to say, we want this. And then we had to get our act together. So that'll be what happens, I think. Right, right. And I think we've we've talked a little bit about the the consumer, and I know we're right at, at time, but we did have another uh, question, and and I'll just note again for any of you who um, had questions in the chat that I might have missed in, in scrolling through here, please don't hesitate to reach out. But um, Terry asks about getting in, better information to the consumer um, for those folks who are are living in in Toronto. So. Not, not maybe the pull from the consumer, but how do we push that information out? And, and maybe we'll wrap up with that question tonight. I'm not sure who wants to, to handle that one first. Can I give a shout out for um, some work we did and then I yes. promise I'll stop. So we, this was one of the things we heard from our shareholders, our members um, at the Canadian Roundtable was that we need to connect better with consumers. So one of our big focuses here during COVID was a, um, a social media campaign in Toronto uh, focused at um, uh, millennials, especially, and um, just so you can go check out the website that we we got them all to kind of lurk through to with beefforthe.planet.ca. So check it out; it's a consumer-facing website. I know it'll be beef, but it's certainly environmentally focused because uh, that's the questions we get, especially from downtown Toronto millennials, is the environmental questions when it comes to beef. So check that website out; you'll enjoy it. Great, great, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to open it up to our, our panelists for any, if any of you have any kind of closing remarks, something you thought about and <laughs> didn't get a chance to say yet, um, just open it up to the four of you. If you don't have anything, that's good, Gary. Uh, yeah, well, there was one question in there about Roundup and, and I, okay. I don't wanna get into <laughs> too much politics here. But glyphosate is very important for farmers, Roundup or glyphosate. And I don't want to see us go down the road of what's happening in Europe and in France. And when I see that question, I, I, I appreciate it very much that we need to be careful what we're doing with our herbicides. Uh, but uh, to uh, grow the crops that we're growing and uh, to use, uh, not have to go back to cultivation. If we're going to keep sequestering carbon and uh, doing an, an, an environmental stewardship, Glyphosate is very important for us and I'll work with that as much as I can to try and help people understand how as important it is. And I think to farmers, they need to be able to use it uh, uh, you know, safely. So I'll leave that there and let the others answer. Yeah, no, I just would, would say I, I was thrilled to have this topic and especially to this group. Um, you know, to be able to talk about sustainable agriculture and, and really drive home how how so connected our mission is uh, to that. I think this was, you know, for me, a valuable uh, conversation, again, to, to reaffirm that importance. So thanks for the discussion tonight, guys. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, Paul? yeah and I just want, wanted to thank Gary and Ann for, for taking time out of their, I know, incredibly busy schedules. Yes. And when we tried to schedule our, our get togethers, um, everyone's busy and we appreciate your time. Um, and appreciate everyone for your interest. Um, as you can tell, the, the five of us are all pretty excited and passionate about agriculture and our role in it. Um, and and I, I think it's, um, it's an exciting time because um, people are just starting to dig a little deeper. And sometimes the information that's out there um, maybe isn't exactly right um, about what uh, agriculture is doing from an environmental perspective. And we're, we're really proud and, and I know the industry really appreciates the, the grounding in science we have. And our, our Institute for Wetland and Waterfall Research is really important in supporting the work that, that Christine and I do. Um, you know, when I started with DU, it was pretty much all waterfall biology that was there. And they have really broadened out and, and done a great job of supporting the work that we do. So I, I want to give them a, a shout out as well, because when DU comes to the table to help support our industry partners or, or the food industry when we get there, um, 
having that that solid science base and being that that pragmatic partner has really helped us a lot. So um, I, I think the the underpinning of science, I, I don't, I can't overstate that that importance. So thank you everybody for your interest today. I really appreciate everyone uh, signing up and and uh, and tuning in. Yeah, Anne, any last comments from you? Thanks. It was a pleasure to be here, and uh, just thanks to Ducks Unlimited for being such a great partner. Um, with us in the beef sector and I'm so pleased that you're part of our roundtable. Thank you. Great. Thanks everyone. Um, I will note that in the chat we have posted a link to get more information on the Guardians of the Grasslands uh, documentary that Christine mentioned, the Beef for the Planet website that, that Anne had mentioned, and then of course the, the previous master classes. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out to, to me if you've uh, if we've missed your question, but uh, again, just want to thank our panelists, uh, Gary and Anne. It's great to have you uh, as partners, and and Christine and Paul. Your your passion for conservation and agriculture shines through. And just like to again thank all of you, the our audience. Um, we really appreciate the the time you take and the the support you give us in in many different ways. So thank you all very much. And uh, Mick wants to point out that uh, he needs we need to eat beef and uh, for wintering birds we need to eat rice so you need to have beef and rice for dinner <laughs> so <laughs> maybe some winter wheat vodka on the side I don't know Will. <laughs> so thank you all very much and um, again for all you do for conservation have a great evening <laughs>